Good morning. Welcome to Living Hope. Let's stand together. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, the wives, the women. Speaking for myself, I stand here today as a man that had a lot of really strong women in my life. And uh, we just want to recognize them today. We want to thank the Lord for them today. I think of my grandmother, my mother, my wife, and just the strength and the spirituality that they poured into my life. So let's pray. Let's get started. Happy Mother's Day. Jesus Christ, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the opportunity to be with you. God, we thank you for the women of this church, the women in our lives. Thank you for their care, their warmth, their strength, the power that they breathe into our lives in our everyday, Lord. During this time, we pray you meet us where we are, whatever we walked in with, whatever state we're in, God, that you would touch us today, touch our hearts, touch our minds, enable us to leave different than we walked in today. In our name we pray, amen.
just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment Never want to leave oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you know
Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The Mom Personal Assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The Mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, Mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. I wish we, I, I could use one of those. Yeah, anyway. Hey, it is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, we're so glad you're here today. But what I wanted to do is I pulled the pastor's wife card, asked Becky to come up and uh, recognize Mother's Day in a little different way and to talk about her experience as a mom and some encouraging, challenging things she can share with you. Thanks, honey. Yeah, it only took 26 years for him to get me up here. <laughs> um, that video made me think of probably the most frequent question I got when my kids were little and all through growing up. I'm sure many of you moms can relate. What's for dinner? <laughs> I feel like from 8 a.m. on, every day, it would be like, what's for dinner? I'm like, I'm not thinking about that right now. <laughs> um, so I'm sure many of you can relate to the humor in that movie, uh, in that video. <clears throat> so when Al asked me to share my thoughts on being a mom, I didn't hesitate to say yes, uh, which is weird because I'm not a public speaker, but I am passionate about the topic, and I truly, truly love being a mom. Um, before I share that, though, I just want to acknowledge to those women today that might be struggling um, with feelings of sadness and loss. I know that this day is hard for many people. Uh, many women struggle on this day because of loss and um, people that are no longer here. And I hope and pray that God provides comfort and healing and peace to each of you today. Um, so for those of you who don't know our family, Al and I have two grown daughters, age 28 and 25, and I had the privilege of spending some time with them yesterday to celebrate Mother's Day. Um, they are strong, beautiful, smart, caring women I am just so very blessed by. I really do feel that they are a gift from God, and I'll just forever be thankful that God chose me to be their mom. <laughs> Uh, my parenting journey obviously is very different now than it was all those years ago. Um, just a few thoughts I wanted to share on this topic. Uh, one of my favorite Bible stories is about Hagar. Hagar is Ishmael's mom, and part of her story is found in Genesis 16. I think the reason why I've always related to this particular mom in the Bible is because she felt alone, she felt invisible, and God revealed himself to her. She refers to God as El Roy, the God who sees me. And as women, as moms, we can often feel alone and invisible. So many of our day-to-day -day tasks are unseen. We think, does anybody notice? Does anybody care? Um, I want to encourage you today by reminding you that God sees you. 
He sees you in your loneliness. He sees you in your struggle, in your exhaustion, in your disappointment, in your insecurity. He sees you in your fear. He sees you in your inadequacies. He sees you in your loss and in your sadness. And his love and his grace is sufficient to cover it all. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I was one of those moms who felt very, very, very weak and inadequate as a mom. I remember when my first was born, and I'm like, crap, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I felt like I had no natural instincts. Um, but God somehow, you know, got me through it, and she survived, and my second one survived. <laughs> um, it's a huge job, and it's an important job, and there's no crash course. So how do we do it well? Not perfectly, of course, but how do we do it well? First, we need to seek God. Pray for your kids. Pray for wisdom in your parenting struggles. Pray for patience. Pray for God to give you insight into your individual kids' hearts. Read his word. Become a learner. Second Peter, verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. That includes our parenting. So seek him and ask him to help guide you and give you all that you need. Second, do not compare yourself to other moms. We are all guilty. Women are terrible at this, about comparing ourselves. As women, as moms, as wives, don't compare yourself. Accept that we all have different strengths and abilities. Com comparison is both defeating and it's paralyzing. It's not gonna help you. It's only gonna hurt you. I've been there, done that. And there will always be another mom that is more creative than you, that is a better cook that seems to have more patience. Um, we don't always see the full picture of somebody's lives, and I think especially in this age of social media, you know, there's always gonna be that mom that just seems more fun, that she's got it more together. Don't, don't compare, it's not gonna get you anywhere. And I guarantee you that the mom that you are comparing yourself to has struggles and challenges as well. You might not see them. Um, no one does this job and this parenting thing perfectly, and God has designed you uniquely and equipped you to parent your children. Um, third, embrace and utilize your village. Grandparents, aunts, friends, your church family, church youth leaders, they are invaluable in raising kids. We cannot do this job alone. Talk to other moms about real life struggles and pray for each other, encourage each other. When my girls were little, I was part of a mom's group at church that was very, very helpful for me. Helped me build my confidence, helped me have that support system and that network, um, helped me to get to know other moms and their kids so that we could trade off on babysitting. It just can be really, really valuable. And I'm just so thankful for the women that God put in both my life and in the lives of my girls to help us on this journey. Um, youth leaders, when my girls were teens, I just am so thankful for the youth leaders that walked alongside of them and could speak into their life at maybe something I didn't see or they wouldn't hear from mom. So youth leaders are very important as well. And for you younger moms out there, seek out a mom that is a little older than you and ask for advice. Don't be afraid to reach out. I guarantee you that that mom, that older mom, has learned lessons that they probably would love to share, and not that we have it all together or know, but I think that there is something to be said about having journeyed through it and learning a little bit. Um, I had several older women that I would go to for advice and support, including both my mom and my mother-in-law, as well as several women in our church. And finally, remember that as much as we love our children, God loves them even more, and that is such a comfort, because as a mom's heart feels like it's just gonna explode with how much love you have for your kids, God loves them even more, and we can trust him. We can trust him with our kids, with his plan for their lives, um, and we have to rest in that, knowing that we're not gonna do it perfectly, and we have to just trust in his grace. So I hope you all have a wonderful, relaxing day, and thanks for allowing me to share.
Hold on. You know the rules. Um, anyway, uh, I won't wait another 26 years. I don't know what it will be, but anyway. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do is, um, you know, I, I think the last year is so challenging to families. I've heard that. I've heard that over and over again. People with their marriages, with parenting, because of the pandemic. And I just want you to understand that don't hesitate to ask for help, for prayer. I uh, may not have all the answers, but that's why God provides the church and the church body in such a manner to connect with each other and support each other, and that's how he's designed it. And so isolation over the last year uh, can cause all kinds of issues in our lives and challenges. So I'm going to ask you to do this. All the women, please stand. You're not going to say anything. Just stand. I want to pray for you, whether you're a mom or not. By the way, if, if you're not a mom, um, uh, the recognition that you can have an influence in someone's life is so important. So the, you women can stand, and I want to pray for you. And I'm grateful for the influence you can have and what God is doing in your life. Lord, thank you so much for um, recognizing moms the way you do. Uh, you don't wait for one day through the year, but you give us stories in Scripture. You give us uh, a reality of the influence. And while our culture has blurred the lines be, between identifying these roles, um, you have not, God, and we're not going to go that route. We are going to look and see the unique steps, the unique process that a mom can provide. And that even when that mom isn't there or isn't able to provide that, God, you step in and you can do certain things. You use your church that way. Thank you for these amazing women. Bless them today. Let them feel encouraged, no matter what their experience has been with a mom or as a mom, that you would just continue to work in them. And we look to them in such a way in our church that they are just a necessary um, powerful component of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Thanks, Beck. You don't have to stay for the message, by the way. So anyway. Um, hey, want to welcome you here this morning. Glad you have uh, come. I just want to do a quick welcome. If you're new here this morning, uh, we're glad you're with us. Take the opportunity um, to get to know us through the connection card, through uh, the Welcome Center. Somebody will be back there. Go to the uh, churchlh.com um, website, and we, you can connect through there as well. And uh, the Church Center app is also provided for you to connect with us. It directs you back to the website and many events that are going on. We're glad you're here. And uh, also, if you want prayer, we would love to have you uh, pray for you today, whether it's coming up here or somebody will be back at the hospitality room across uh, from the center doors after the service. They'd love to pray for you as well. And uh, we had a great time on Friday night. We had the movie night, and I really thought it was going to rain, but I don't know. John Murphy, our uh, student ministry director, he prayed, and his prayers are effective because it didn't rain. It was raining all around us. So we had a great time. A little over 100 people were there, and, um, and we had a good time, and we're going to do that again. I told John we're going to schedule another one. So it was a great time to be in the parking lot. Thanks for those of you that were part of that and that made that happen. I appreciate that. Hey, some things coming up. Men, you have a dart tournament on the 21st, and uh, we are going to look forward to getting together with you guys. Um, it's an opportunity for you to connect. You have a, a service project on the 29th, and so you can stay tuned to um, our calendar and our website for those events, but we'd love to have you there. You can register for those things as well. And then one of the things we've recognized in coming out of the pandemic and people coming back to church and having to restore some of these areas like children's ministry, um, hospitality, all of these things is that we just don't have the servers. Every church is experiencing this. And so we realize that some of you that um, when the pandemic happened, you obviously naturally stopped serving, and we need you back. We need you because God, what he does in the church is he tells us to equip people to serve the body of Christ, to be able to do the work of the ministry. So we have areas of hospitality, of the youth ministry staff, children's ministry. Every one of you has the ability to serve in a gift from God. We could use you because we want to slowly restore these areas, especially children's ministry and youth that uh, need attention, and we'd love for you to be part of it. You can sign up online as a volunteer. We will get back to you very quickly. Don't worry about that. If you offer it out, we'll be there and fit something around you in the schedule that works for you, but we'd love for you um, to serve here, and uh, we're grateful for those servers that have stepped back in in the last few weeks. 
All right, we are in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. What an exciting chapter. If you've read this, you'd go, oh my goodness, this is hard. It's a very difficult chapter because it's Peter writing some very direct words about false teaching. And so this morning, I want to continue off of where we started last week. We looked at verses 1 to 10 in 2 Peter chapter 2. I invite you to grab your phone and look that passage up or Bibles at the back table, or you can open your own Bible if you have it. But Peter began to talk about false teaching. And last week I acknowledged that for some of us, when we read passages in the Bible about false teaching, we kind of, and I did this, maybe I'm the only one, but I look at it and I say, false teaching? Come on, all the churches I've been at, their doctrinal statement hasn't changed for years. And we don't worry about that. But when you look at the topic of false teaching in Scripture, it's a real threat to the church. False teaching is not a threat only in certain circumstances, only in certain churches or churches with different governmental structures, or only in certain places and cultures around the world. We must recognize that it is a threat as a threat because the Bible continually warns us about that threat. Jesus warned us that false teachers will come from the outside and try to influence the teaching of good doctrine and his words about who he is and what he was trying to do and the intent of him coming to earth. Peter tells us that false teachers can also arise within the community. And that's what we see here in 2 Peter, that these false teachers would already be in the community of faith and that they would begin teaching things slightly different than everything else that we've heard, and that they would be destructive and poisonous, as this book says, as this letter says. The Apostle Paul continually warned that churches uh, that he served in, that if false teachers were in their midst um, and were left unchecked, that it would result in disastrous consequences for the church. Simply put, false teaching is not just for other people to listen to and pay attention to. As much as we may be tempted when we pass by chapters like 2 Peter chapter 2, we are passing by a warning that God wants me to hear, listen to, and heed, and that we must be vigilant about false teaching and proper teaching in the church because it can creep into our lives. Last week, I reminded you that for many of us, it may not be us as a teacher, but as influencers of children, influencers of other people, that what happens to us is that we can begin to absorb all that the world is saying, all that the world is doing, and philosophy and thinking. I shared last week, and I got a response from this online uh, in, in emails, and I didn't expect that, and I said one of the things I had to guard myself against is that my political persuasion is mostly conservative. And when I listened to conservative talk radio, I found myself getting very much reliant and passionate more about that than I did about the Word of God. So this past year, as all the conspiracy theories popped up, some from the left, some from the right, whatever they were, I found myself saying, and I told one young man, please use the filter of God's Word because God does not communicate this way. Be careful how much you're filling your mind with conservative or liberal talk radio because it will influence your thinking and it will filtrate and start merging with the word of God. And you will believe certain things in scripture that it does not teach about government, politics, and be careful. Something that I see as a trend. Had some good email interactions this past week on that topic. Well, Peter reminded us and told us that false prophets and teachers, as I said, were all over the place. And he was very strong in his language. He said that they will be purporting destructive heresies, but they're not the people that are going to walk in and look like false teachers. They're not going to say, I'm a false teacher. Listen to me. They're not even going to have positions in the church, but they may be influencers. And we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes, but they were dangerous. And that for all of us, knowing the truth so well and knowing the Bible and interacting with it, we can identify lies that are out there. We can identify those things. But what he now does in verses 10 to 22 is that he kind of sets up a profile, a profile that of characteristics. So real basic today, 
I'm going to identify some of the characteristics, or all of them, that are um, in this passage. Not the most exciting Mother's Day message. It isn't. But it reminds me of God's protection, God's love for me, his love for his church, and his love for his word. And he doesn't want me to become victim of this thinking. And so this warning in Scripture, now that Peter gives it, is something we have to heed. He gives this profile almost as if you'd identify a wanted poster, right? False teachers. And the false teacher is always the wolf in sheep's clothing. He's always the one that looks okay. Last week I said, good men who tell lies are the most dangerous people. Good men who tell lies are the most dangerous people. And that the church can regard some of the biggest names in Christianity that we see on TV and other places and we can say, well, I listen to this person, I listen to that person, and we start elevating the person. That is some of the characteristics that Peter's going to share here. So let's jump into this. I'm not going to have all the scripture on the screen. In fact, I'm not going to have any of it. So you can turn there. I hope you listen through this, but we're going to start out in verse 10. And he begins to identify this profile with the first couple of characteristics. They were boastful and slanderous. He says, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. We're going to explain this. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Wow, I mean, you're like, wow, these are dangerous people. My goodness, these can't be just the, you know, the people that I, I, I'm not aware of, they should be blatant. They should have a tag on them saying, false teacher, dangerous. Don't go near this person. Don't listen to them. But we have to remember what was happening during Peter's context is that the church was scattered and there were people that were coming together at occasion and listening to and getting connected with influencers in the church. And the church did not have the benefit of various, various copies of the word of God. As letters went out, churches were shared with those letters of Paul and Peter. But there was a vulnerability to the church that maybe now we don't have. There's other vulnerabilities for us. But the characteristic that some of these false teachers had is that they were boastful and slanderous. slanderous. We understand that humility is one of the marks in which God wants leaders Christians to have as they serve him. They do not want, he does not want boastful, prideful individuals. But what would happen in the context of the church is that as leaders were elevated or influencers were elevated, and you can see this nowadays, what would happen is that people would start elevating leaders. I got to go listen to Billy Graham. I got to hear this person. I got to hear that person. I follow this person. I follow that person. And it wasn't that person maybe lifting themselves up, but like any individual, that person would gain a following and their ego would be built. And so if they had a mega church or they had something bigger, they influencer, and they could say, ah, you know what? I like this. They became more confident in their own ability, less confident in what God was doing through them. They became so self-confident that at times it wasn't about God and Jesus, maybe many times. It was about them, their ministry, building what they had. They were brazen. They were cocky. And people kind of drifted towards those people. You say, well, who would be following somebody who's cocky and slanderous and, you know, brazen? You'd be amazed. We follow political leaders that way. We follow religious leaders that way. We follow sports people that way. There's something about it that can be appealing. Hey, they say what exactly is on their mind. A false teacher doesn't have much regard of what God is telling them. And even at the same time they don't, they will claim it's from God. You can turn on a TV evangelist nowadays and 
There's a lot of truth they're sharing. But there's a lot of lies they're sharing. Whether it be in the context of healing or prosperity or in any one of those things, what's happening to them is that they're just elevating themselves and they're making it a business. That's not what Jesus intended with his church. I'm reminded of this, that where did Jesus get most angry and why do we see words like this in scripture that Peter are writing that are just so direct? Did Jesus get most angry at the woman caught in adultery? Did he get most angry at the woman at the well who was obviously in a number of sinful relationships? Did he get most angry at the tax collector? Did he get most angry at the people that needed him the most, that were committing the most sins, that were notorious sinners? No, do you know who he got most angry at? Religious people who made it about themselves, who were legalistic, following all the rules, but had a lack of love, but were narcissistic and self-serving and self-confident. Go through Scripture and you will see God's anger burning against false prophets, burning against Pharisees, religious leaders, the most religious, Jewish religious leaders. They didn't reflect the humble heart of Jesus. The slanderous words that they're using here, it says uh, reviling. It has a, a unique example. It says, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, don't pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Kind of hard to understand. But what he's saying is that these religious leaders would look at the spiritual forces of darkness, right? God says we have a spiritual battle going on. And they would look at these spiritual forces of darkness and kind of cast condemnation on them. Sounds okay, right? We've done that. Satan, get away. Or Satan, you have no control over me. It's kind of yelling out those things. Some religious practices exist that way in churches. But what it was, particularly for them, is that there was no humility in that. It was about the intent of the heart in which they would say to Satan and his demons, God calls them glorious ones here, the ones that live in that spiritual realm. And he says, are you doing that in my power or are you doing that in yours? Are you doing it for show or are you doing it for me? Because we know that with Christianity and with our faith in Christ, that humility the, the verse that Becky read, that weakness that I have isn't a weakness so that I'm defeated. It's a weakness to say, I am weak without God, and the only strength I have is God. That should produce a humility in our lives. These characteristics aren't just for us to pay attention to for false teachers. They are for us to pay attention to for things in our life. These leaders and false teachers were people that were out for themselves, but there was a day in which I'm sure their heart was right, their intentions for ministry were right, and Satan said, if I can grab a hold of any one of their hearts and get them about themselves and get them about something else other than the kingdom of God and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then I've accomplished something great. Because, guys, the greatest threat to Christianity is not out there. It's not liberal Democrats. You think God is afraid of people? He's not afraid of false teachers in the church, but you know who Satan uses the most? He's gonna bring down the church from inside, not outside. In fact, persecution is supposed to happen to the church. And that I should expect that if I'm living for Christ, I should be persecuted. But Satan knows that if he can grab a hold of a leader, send him off in another path of teaching, and that doesn't focus on Christ, or that's a little different, or adds to the gospel, or puts rules and legalism in, he can do great damage to generations of people that are under his teaching or her teaching. They're boastful. They're slanderous. They're not humble. Second set of characteristics, they're carousing and greedy, it says here. It says, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. You get the anger that Peter has here? Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam. References an Old Testament story I'm going to mention in a moment. But what he says is that these leaders are going to end up just being kind of party people. 
Maybe in the context of what the abundant life is, I'm going to make it material. I'm going to make it just one big adventure. Could you imagine preaching that during Peter's time? You're about, the Christian world is about to be slaughtered in Rome by Nero. There was fear all over the place, warranted fear. Fear that because I follow Jesus, I'm going to be slaughtered. There was young Christians that were vulnerable. These leaders, these false teachers would come in and maybe one message one week or one teaching one week sounded really good and the next week they kind of introduced something else in. You go, wait a minute, something wrong with that. False teaching isn't that everything they say is wrong. It means that they're introducing their own philosophy, their own thought. Remember, if everything goes through the filter of Scripture and say, what does God think about this? You will not be led astray. You will not be leading others astray. You may not have every answer, but you won't be going down the road that says sin is okay because Jesus died and just let's abuse grace. Or material things are really the end goal of this life. And that God wants you to be wealthy and prosperous all the time. Well, then there's a lot of people who claim the name of Christ. They have not one dime to their name. And we must admit, well, they must not be part of the family of God. See, they show up at the church. It says here that they kind of show up at the right time. And they connect with the church. And at, during this time, what would happen is that in, in the history that we know is that there was not a lot of church assemblies that were meeting publicly because they were kind of hiding out in the secret church. And what would happen is that, that sometimes they would get together for just meals so that they weren't identified as Christians publicly. And it was normal for them to protect themselves. They weren't denying their faith. They were practicing under some protection. But they would get together and they would kind of drift and lead some of these younger Christians away. I really believe the description here is not of identified church leaders as much as it was influencers in the church, people who had the ability to teach, people who had the ability to influence. Maybe they had good positions in society, but people looked up to them. And sometimes that's where Satan will attack first as I get this influencer and they can lead you astray and teach you something other than the things that God wants you to know. He references a story here in the Old Testament of Balaam. We're not going to go into the detail, but the, the, the liking in which he kind of compares to Balaam. And Balaam was a, um, a spiritualist, not of God. And Balaam, when God looked at him, there was times he spoke the word of God. There was times he didn't. And one of Israel's enemies of Moab had sought to get Balaam. Because you know why Balaam did? He lived in the middle some days it was like, ah, I spoke the word of God. Other days, he just was this spiritual kind of psychic who claimed to know the future. And so people would go to him because he really wasn't identified anywhere. In an age of tolerance, it's going to be so easy for us to say the safest people and the most appealing people are the people that don't really stand for anything. They don't really stand for anything. Balaam was kind of that guy. He claimed to have a message from God. So Balak comes to him and he says, I want to know this about Israel. Can you cast a curse on Israel? Can you do this? And eventually, Israel, who has God's support, doesn't allow it to happen, but it just shows and reveals the heart of a false teacher is like that person in the middle. You don't know where their allegiance is. Is it about them or is it about God? It causes us to think, check your own heart, Al, when it comes to ministry. Why are you doing what you're doing? The best acts and the best, best deeds and the best servanthood can be done out of selfish motive, motives in order to just reveal my good deeds to people. And Jesus says, I don't want to see those things. Check your heart. And every leader and teacher has to check their heart of why are they doing this? Do they want the pulpit? Do they want the stage? Do they want the voice? Why are they doing what they're doing? Third characteristic is they were waterless fountains. Waterless fountains. You say, well, what is that? He describes here in one verse, these are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. 
This is a really encouraging passage, isn't it, for Mother's Day? You guys like this one? You'll remember this Mother's Day passage, Mother's Day message. He says, they are people that are a prom- promising spiritual life, but the message that they're offering is nothing. It's worthless. You know, we're going to talk in a minute about distorting the gospel of freedom as he mentions it here. But one of the things that can happen in our churches is that we can elevate tradition, elevate certain elements that I'm used to in the history of the church to such a place that we say, well, that's the way it's done. And my experience at church, maybe like yours or it's different from yours, but I can go, yeah, but this is what feels good. This is what feels right. And, you know, we start adding things to what we think church should be like because it's comfortable for me. And then it becomes intentional. And then it becomes non-negotiable. I don't know exactly what these were teaching, but they were distorting the gospel, as we're going to see in a minute. But what they were teaching was offering nothing, is what Peter says. Nothing to people. Maybe it was Jewish, legalistic, religious leaders saying, listen, yeah, believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you better have your hair short enough You better dress like this on Sunday morning. You better talk like this. You better serve like this. You better do this. You better do that. All good things, but then elevating those things to the place in which you say, well, that's what a Christian is. That's how we identify a Christian. And what it actually does is such damage to the gospel is that people will drift towards the things They can do to please God and less about emphasizing the grace of God and the fact that you and I can do nothing to attract God. Nothing. And this is what he leads into in this last bit of it that I want to talk about. They were distorting the gospel of freedom. Verses 18 to 22. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever outcome overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. He starts to talk about what would really be the context of somebody saying, well, you know what? You can be a Christian and still do anything you want. There were those that believed that wholeheartedly. There still are those that would say grace is just Such a wonderful thing that I'm safe with God. Hey, I'm getting to heaven. I'm getting in by the skin of my teeth, but I'm getting in. I can do anything I want. So people weren't paying attention to their purity. They weren't paying attention to their spiritual disciplines. They weren't paying attention to the things God wanted them to pay attention to. They weren't loving to their neighbor. They weren't caring. They weren't generous. They weren't giving. Maybe they didn't commit the biggest of sins or they didn't commit the worst of sins that the community said was bad, but their heart was just filled with a lot of anger, resentment, and they just said, but I look good. And there was a little bit of that abused grace, maybe not a little, maybe a lot. Maybe there were those who kind of attached all the legalistic sides to Christianity. This is probably more common to some of us as we grew up in the church. I've told the story how my parents didn't come to Christ until they were close to 40. And as they did, my my house was very normal, non-Christian house as they were, I was growing up. I didn't have a lot of rules. I I didn't have a lot of rules after they became a Christian. And it was just very normal. So when I came to church and then went to Bible college, I would look at Christians who had a lot of rules. I go, this is really weird. Like everybody looks the same. And it it was, it was strange. And, And I remember in Bible college, I probably wasn't regarded as the most spiritual because I didn't follow all the rules, and I didn't. Some of them I should have followed. But but I remember looking at the Christian, and there was a part of it where I said, "Uh, I don't know about this. Now, there was things I needed to pay attention to. There wasn't a license to reject, but Understand this, we can define the Christian life by rules so much that we distort the gospel. We distort what Jesus did. We can believe grace so much, but then when we need it so bad, we go, yep, 
God can't cover that. Or somebody else needs it so that God can't cover that. We can look at Scripture in such a way to believe that we know every answer. That when we talk about theology in which God has not revealed the answer to it, we act like he has. By the way, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I don't know exactly what heaven's going to look like. I don't know a lot of things I read in the book of Revelation. I can give you my best interpretation, but I will never stand wholeheartedly on something that for centuries people have debated and somehow I'm going to come to the answer of that. What was happening with false teachers is they always come with a claim that they know the new profound thought from Scripture. Do you know what I struggle with? The things that are really clear in Scripture. And I need to practice those. When I taught the book of Revelation some years ago, I think it was horrible because I kept saying, well, Al may be wrong. God hasn't revealed this. Al may be wrong. God is not asking me to know it all. He's asking me to be a humble leader, admitting that I have failures, that I need him, and that I got to be careful what I'm teaching, what I'm adding to and what I'm taking away. A seminary, a Bible college professor said, we so rightly divide, we so rightly divide the word of God that we wrongly divide the body of Christ. And we have to be careful. Churches have lived in their division. They've lived under a framework to reject other people because they're convinced this is what God told them. When we look in scripture and we say, I'm not sure exactly where that can be found. And so there's many times when I sit with somebody and they tell me their thing of theology, I say, well, show me where that's in Scripture. Show me where that's at. I'm not trying to fight with them, but show me where that point of it is. Because we'll come to agreement on the things we know clearly, but be careful. False teachers could take those things, sink roots deep into those thinking, and say, this is what it's about, and then it becomes about them and their viewpoint. That's not what God wanted. But God wants me to be on guard. He wants me to be humble. He wants me to be loving. He wants me to stand strong on the word of God, not stand strong on Al's viewpoints. And he wants me to be following him solely and no one else. I'm going to ask the praise band to come forward and they're going to close with a song. As they do today, I I want you to do something a little different than what maybe this passage points to. This passage was intended for you and I to identify those false teachers. Identify the ones with the wrong thinking and the wrong teaching. But how about for you, identify the things that are in your heart that maybe you can look at and say, these these things, yeah, they're a philosophy that I kind of know I've adopted in life that, you know, I, I just don't think, God wants me to adopt. Some of the things, I'll share some of the things I wrote down as we close. That I can elevate material things in this life much higher than spiritual things. Material things are not bad. They're not evil. Money's not evil. The love of those things is. The love. So I will do intentional things to make sure I'm not living out that theology. I'll give generously at times. I will let go of what I deserve because I know that will be my pitfall. Another theology that I fight with is, well, I know God says to forgive, but I'm only going to forgive in certain instances. That person just did too much. Or they don't deserve it. Or they're a repeat offender. No, I'm supposed to forgive in all instances. And that forgiving is a struggle that I've got to walk through. How about the theology that says there's not enough grace in this world to make me feel adequate, to make me feel good, to make me feel like I'm ready to serve God. God doesn't want to make you feel anyway. He's told you who you are. And you are loved by him. And he wants you 
to live in his grace and know him better and better. That your past is your past and your future is going to have pitfalls, but God loves you. Stand for this last song. Lord, thank you for a great God, being a great God. Thank you for loving us. We trust you. Thank you for protecting us. In Jesus' name, amen. are fixated on anything but you. The definition of truth. God, mold my heart. Make it look more like you every day. 
And God, again, we thank you for each woman in this place, the invaluable women of this place. Thank you for the ones in my life that worked so hard, prayed so hard to form me into the man I am today. We thank you for them. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Shaking, it won't flee. You're there before I call. 